Uh, I was approached to do this uh, topic uh, utilization uh, uh, a while ago, and it got me to thinking about it. So uh, th this is sort of interesting because it uh, allows me to go back and, and do a couple things with this. Uh, some of the old timers might enjoy it and, and some of the new people. But those of you who know nothing about utilization, well, uh, hopefully this will provide some eye-opening experiences for you. So let, let's have at it. I got a bunch of slides. They are available as a PDF so that you can follow along or jot notes or things of that nature. Uh, feel, feel free to use that. So uh, um, we're, we're going to do this. Um, if I can figure out how to move the slide link. There we go. So uh, the, the real title of this presentation is Utilization of Government Property, the Forgotten Process and Outcome. I, I'm trying to instill a little bit of humor here, and you'll, you'll see why in comparing old with new, why, why we would consider it a, a forgotten process. So uh, here, here's some rhetorical questions. Here are some rhetorical questions. I, I know that we're supposed to keep records of utilization of government property. So to what does this apply to or to what type of government property does this apply? And it's really uh, all government property? No, because material is not utilized. It's consumed. So that leaves us four other classes in the, the government property typology that are out there. Uh, equipment, special tooling, uh, special test equipment. I'm not going to deal with real property because, well, we've had lots of discussion that the government really doesn't furnish real property. Uh, that, that's another topic. So the main focus of this discussion for utilization is going to be dealing with equipment, special test equipment, and special tooling and its utilization there. So here, here's the way I'm going to structure it. Uh, some discussions about why utilization is important. Uh, I'd like to present to you some of the historical requirements, some really old stuff, right? Uh, yeah, and when I say that, I'm really talking about when I started in government property uh, back in 1978 as a lowly GS5, as an industrial property management specialist, working uh, with one of my contractors, the gentleman's name was Tom Ruckdashel, some of you might remember him. I was the government guy, he was the contractor guy, and these were the types of things we had to argue over. I'm then going to move and look at the contemporary requirements that are out there, and give you a few ideas as to some, some of the literature that's there as well. So, uh, why is the construct of utilization or using a property important? And, and the answer is quite simply because it is value. We take for granted the actual need. Now, I've, I've been out there a long time in both the government and industry running around. And from real world experience, every engineer that I've ever dealt with tells us that they need every piece of equipment, regardless of its condition or actual use. They want to hang on to everything. For the, any of the engineers who are in the group, my apologies to you. But you got to admit, most of you are pack rats who like to keep stuff. Any, any of you that are on the government or contractor side know that going into an engineering lab, uh, you, you see lots of stuff out there, and you really got to wonder, gee, do they need all this stuff? So that, that's, a, that's a concern that I have witnessed and, and need to look at. So the better part of this is that I have empirical evidence. Uh, Deming said that uh, without data, all you have is opinion. So I, I wanted to make sure that I provided you hard, cold, empirical data that shows you that if you manage utilization properly, and, and this is regardless of whether this is government-owned stuff or contractor-owned stuff, it, it adds value. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, Mr. Bob McFarland, a well-regarded property professional uh, in the NPMA, published three articles. Uh, it really was one article made into a series of articles in the property professional, and I've cited their volume and issue. You can find all of these on the NPMA webpage under archive uh, uh, articles. Lots of thick, rich description as to how he analyzed the process of utilization using another uh, entity, another company working with them to try and find out the actual utilization of, of a lot of this stuff that's out there. The beauty of it was his end result. His end result specifically, he saved $22.5 million. 
He saved his company over a six-year period over $22.5 million. So my comment down there, don't believe me, read the articles, read, analyze the data. Absolutely amazing. And if you want to go one step further, one of our other NPMA members, Mr. Larry Miramontes, did a presentation entitled Becoming Bob McFarland, where he implemented, he applied the same strategies that Bob did in, in his company to obtain cost savings, to obtain cost avoidance. So we have not only the, the original empirical data, but we have additional data of others who have replicated uh, his approach, his process, and uh, one hopes the findings as to cost savings within that. So from that alone, from a monetary standpoint, it gives us some idea that utilization and the review of utilization, the managing of utilization is, is of importance to, to either side of the equation, either government folks or industry folks, to be able to uh, properly manage those assets. So um, my comment here, let's see how this plays out. I'm going to take you back to a time long, long ago with some regulations that some of the new people might never have heard of. The Armed Services Procurement Regulation, ASPR, and the Defense Acquisition Regulations, uh, DAR. Uh, both of those were documents prior to 1984 that had existed for decades. And, and we used Appendix B out of those two documents, really. They were the same document. They just changed the name. And Appendix B was the contractual document binding upon contractors before the FAR. So what I did, I extracted from Appendix B uh, a number of portions that did with you deal, dealt with utilization. And here we have B603. Contractors' procedures shall be in writing. Okay, that's good. That's normal. And adequate I to assure that government property will be used only for the purposes authorized in the contract and for II to provide a basis for determining and allocating rental charges. I think we'll see a very similar statement to that effect in our current regulatory schema. But though this is, is nice in and of itself, there was a lot more prior to the FAR uh, publication uh, for, for utilization there. So here, here's the second part, which established utilization requirements for, well, a strange form of equipment. In those days of the DAR and Asperis, some folks, some of the old timers out there, right, might remember we have things called IPE and OPE. Industrial plant equipment and other plant equipment. Industrial plant equipment had a specific dollar threshold. And, and look what it required uh, within that uh, item. Establish a minimum level of utilization. Wow. So, so wait, we wanted to establish some type of threshold below which if you use this, uh, fail to use the property below a certain level, then you, you need it to really justify why it's still there. The utilization level may be established for individual items or families items, depending upon circumstances. Sure, we wouldn't want the same level of utilization specified for uh, milling machines uh, and multi-station lathes as we would for potentially uh, smaller items. Uh, uh, we might want a more specific degree of utilization for vehicles and things of that nature. Item II says, hey, you're to record both authorized and actual use. I'll talk about that a little bit later, how that plays out. Periodic analyses of production needs for IP and future utilization based upon known requirements. Not what you think you're going to get, but what actually you have in-house, right? And then have firm provisions, or in other words, direction, for immediately reporting to the contracting officer all IP items for which retention is not justified. In other words, the declaration of excess. Wow, th this is a lot more stuff than we have in the FAR today. These all come from my old books, and I scanned them and tried to make this look slight. Forgive me, it's a little bit fuzzy. But it is direction out of Asper Supplement 3, which was the PA's old guidance prior to the DOD Property Manual 4161, which was 
rescinded and is now replaced by the DOD guidebook that's out there. But basically it says that somebody in the government, in this case the PA, though other people may help, have the responsibility for assuring that the contractor has effective procedures to evaluate IPE utilization. And though it rests with the PA, uh, there are other specialists who are qualified to perform the technical portion of utilization surveys, assist the PA in determining that. So there were specialists out there, and, and to this day, there are specialists out there that can help with this. So we see that there's guidance even from an audit standpoint. So one of the comments I have here is that this review could have been done by a, a different person, not a property professional, not a property administrator, property manager, property specialist, but a different person in the government, a production specialist, and, and they go by the GS 1150 series, while property is 1103, production is 1150, and they can provide different types of guidance in terms of looking at the utilization of equipment, because that is their specialty, versus uh, some of our folks who don't really look at equipment and machinery and understand how ST, ST and equipment can be used there. Um, here, here's some additional guidance out of ASPRA Supplement 3. Again, the PA's guidance. The PA shall require the contractor to establish procedures and techniques for controlling the utilization of government-owned IPE. Interesting. Okay, so in theory, we're, we're looking at many of the same requirements that, A, we expect the contractor to have a system to properly use equipment, use SD, STE, uh, and use it only for an authorized purposes. And here we see the tasking of the government property administrator to go and audit that process. And the audit requirements for this are also called out within the uh, uh, DOD guidebook for property administration that's out there on the Pentagon website. Sort of the same stuff that the PA does today, but note, that for IP, that had an acquisition cost of $5,000 originally. Uh, yes, I put down the word value there. Really, we were talking about acquisition costs. Even more guidance uh, for what the PA is supposed to do, the survey, the audit, the system analysis, PMSA, should normally be conducted on a continual basis reviewing equipment utilization records. Wow. Equipment utilization records, okay. We'll need to see that further and how that plays out. Uh, maximum use of contractor machine loading data, order boards, production planning uh, records, machine time records, other production control. Wait a minute. Do we really have that stuff today? Do we really look at that stuff today, either on the government side or industry side, or have we moved into sort of a, a different perspective in terms of government equipment uh, that's out there. So my, my uh, uh, exclamation down on the bottom, whoa, what the heck is all of that stuff? Those were items that in the past and in many times today, you can see at a contractor's facility if they're dealing with lots and lots of heavy machine working equipment that's out there. But we're gonna break this down a little bit later into some of the, the smaller stuff. Not going to bore you with this, but more, more discussion from Supplement 3. So there was a lot more guidance, a lot more discussion uh, in the old days, in the 70s for me, uh, than there is today in 2017. So we had other government property clauses. You might have remembered that before 2007, uh, we had 19 government property clauses. Two of them called out the use of government property. Others did as well. The facility clause is not going to go there. But if we were to look at dash two or dash five, paragraph D probably has verbatim the words that we have today also. The government property shall be used only for performing this contract unless otherwise provided in this contract or approved by the contracting officer. Pretty standard stuff. Pretty standard stuff there. FAR Part 45, and, and if you look back prior to 2007 with the publication of the new FAR, uh, FAR 45.5 
was a section that was contractually binding upon the contractor. How did we do that? It was an incorporation by reference. So anything under FAR 45.5, the contractor had to follow. And here we see further guidance. Contractor's procedure shall be in writing, an adequate one, to assure that government property will be used only for those purposes authorized in this contract and that any required approvals are obtained. Provide a basis for determining and allocating rental charges. Once again, this is very similar to what we look at today in FAR 52.245-1. Uh, moving this to the contractor clausal requirements. But again, we go back to that stuff called industrial plant equipment, or since the FAR dealt with all agencies and NASA really didn't like the construct of IPE or OPE, uh, we couldn't really call that term out in the FAR, but notice it, it echoes, it parallels what we saw under the darn asper. Minimum level of use, analysis of need shall be made in retention justified, recording authorized and actual use, periodic analyses, reporting to the CO for which retention is not justified, i.e. it was excess. That was a big requirement there. Lots of requirements under the old government property requirements there. Well, we're going to have to take a little bit closer look when we get to the FAR requirements. What are we dealing with today under 52.245-1 and any other guidance given to the government side of the house as policy requirements? So here's my first statement. There are no explicit regulatory requirements to track the use of government property. In this case, ST, ST and equipment. So what I'd like to do is look at the government policy and look at the clausal requirements to see if there are any implicit requirements. The difference between those that are explicitly stated and those that are implicit that we must recognize based upon other requirements. So here's our current policy under FAR 45.3. This is guidance, direction to the government now. This is not binding upon the contractor. This is guidance and direction to the government because it's under FAR Part 45. And in, in this requirement, it says government property shall normally be provided on a rent-free basis in performance of the contract under which it is accountable. First thing, if you are furnished government property under that instant contract, the contract under which it's accountable, the assumption is you're going to use it under that contract and that, that use is going to be on a rent-free basis. But we might see that things change along the way. Notice the second part there, or is otherwise authorized. The contracting officer has every right to authorize use on other contracts, related contracts, uh, so long as he or she is the contracting officer for that other contract as well. If there were two or three or four or, or more contracting officers because of the number of contracts, uh, well, each of those would have to get involved from an authorization standpoint. Not going to talk about the bottom part of rental charges, not really important or germane here. Uh, this provides us other policy as to when, when a, a rent-free use of property uh, can be done. Uh, we have many of our members that, at universities and other nonprofit activities. Uh, there we can authorize rent-free use if there's some concern with the national interest, the uh, DOD security concerns, uh, not used for the direct benefit of a profit-making organization and that we hope the government receives from such benefit that this would, through the work of the nonprofit, benefit society as a whole, as a larger requirement. So here we see further amplification that in exchange for consideration, we use the term consideration, not just rent there, but the government is expected to receive consideration. The contractor may, conditional, may use government uh, property under fixed price contracts other than the contract to which it is accountable there. They, you may use it, but the government is supposed to obtain consideration. When after a contract award, ah, so post-award, you've received a contract 
but you'd never specified that you were going to use government property, and now you come in and request the use of property, contracting officer shall obtain a fair rental, we'll talk about rental, or other adequate consideration if use is authorized. Fair, well, how do I determine fair rental? That we would do under the use and charges clause, which requires a computation using time of actual use. So you have to wonder, <clears throat> is this another implicit requirement that forces us to track utilization or use of that government property? In my opinion, if I have to compute rent to provide a fair rental, then it, I must be able to tell the government how much that property is being used or how much it is planned that that property will be used on that other contract there. Uh, we can authorize use of government property on a rent-free basis when it's a cost-type contract. It makes sense because if we charge the contractor for use under cost reimbursement by contract, the contractor would just charge it back to the government, plus they would now fully load their G&A costs onto that. So uh, wise idea that we don't charge rent under cost reimbursement. Uh, we can also authorize a contractor to use government property for commercial use, for commercial use. Now, that's, that's an interesting construct. They can use it for commercial contracts. Contractors can use this for commercial use. Yes, they may. But certain things are, are, are required. Number one, you must come in and ask, mother, may I? And then there's a second requirement that uh, if, if it's going to exceed 25% of the time available for total use of government and commercial work, then quite clearly, I have to go even higher than the contracting officer. CO has authority to, to authorize the commercial use up to 25% head of the contracting activity if it is expected to exceed 25%. So even here, there are thresholds. And here we go one more time with my rhetorical question. If you do not track utilization for all use, government use and commercial use, rent uh, free use, rental use, how can you track 25% of the total use of government property for the above requirement? So this is a tacit requirement. This is policy directed at the government. How is the contractor supposed to know this? Well, here's my answer. Doesn't all non-governmental use require permission? coming in to the contracting officer and asking, Mother, may I? I hope, I hope that the CO would address this requirement in the authorization there for proper tracking of it. For IR&D, independent research and development programs, definitely a requirement to uh, get some consideration there back from the contractor because that IR&D might very well, yes, benefit us, but might very well benefit the contractor and its commercial work. So again, this type of use would need to be tracked to be able to compute the rental charge. No explicit requirement. All of these are built in. All of these are implicit. If we take a step back and look at FAR 45.2, this deals with asking for the use of property prior to the award of a contract. And this is sort of a problematic issue. This would have worked better if uh, the government, we the government, had created a solicitation provision to require all offers to submit the following information. But we, we sort of made a boo-boo there. We could have done this a little bit better. In point of fact, Professor Chuck Wazat had crafted a, a solicitation provision sort of died on the vine. It never got there. But look at item two. The dates during the which the property will be available for use, including first, last, and all intervening months, and for any property that will be used concurrently in performing two or more contracts, the amount of respective use in sufficient detail to support prorating the rent. So there's my asterisk. And I, I'm getting a little bit testy there, but notice it says there is that pesky 
implicit requirement for usage data, but in this case, even before contract award, that if your contractor are going to use government furnished property, government property prior, uh, um, uh, and you know about that prior to the award of a contract, this provision or this policy on the part of the government, if requested by the government contracting officer, says you have to tell us about that. Otherwise, it turns into a post-award utilization request. And that can get really nasty because, simply put, the government could say, no, contractor, you said you could perform this contract without any government property. We expect you to perform. Are, are you telling us that you can't perform? If then, do we have to do a show cause notice and all? So understand that the requirement here is, the belief here is, we want you to tell us about this equipment or SD or SD that you want to use on other contracts before contract award so we can have a fair and open competition, so we can eliminate any competitive advantage, which is another part of the contracting process that's out there. So once again, here's my rhetorical question. Without keeping records of actual time used, how could you comply and provide the required data? Nowhere does it say that as a clause of requirement, but in point of fact, it becomes a tacit requirement, an implicit requirement. So from these policy statements, there's an implicit requirement for you to establish and maintain records of the actual use of the government property, and it appears that that record-keeping requirement serves multiple purposes. So. What do the clauses say? The clauses that are in your contract, the clauses that are contractually binding, 52245-1, 52245-9. Here's our first requirement under the umbrella paragraph, paragraph B. It says that you shall have a system of internal controls to manage government property. And then there's a parenthetical in there. To control that property, use that property, preserve, protect protect, repair, maintain that property. Pretty standard from what we saw in the old uh, DAR and ASPR language to what we see here as our overarching premise in the current uh, FAR iteration. Paragraph C talks about use of government property. Reiterative, only for performing this contract. Other, only otherwise provided for in this contract or approved by the CO. We have seen this before and it has existed. This requirement has existed for decades, decades out there. Here's paragraph F, which calls out our processes and outcomes, our, our 10 outcomes that if we really dissect them carefully, they turn into 15, potentially 16 outcomes. So here we have paragraph F1VIII, entitled Utilizing Government Property, but here are four separate and distinct processes. Utilize, consume, move, and store. Well, really, I'm only going to look at the first one, which is utilize. Consumption of material, totally different requirement. Movement of property, totally different process and outcome. Storage of government property, totally and different process and outcome there. So, basically, it's that the contractor shall utilize, use government property, only as authorized under this contract. Good. We've seen that before. We understand that. Now there's a second twist. The contractor shall promptly disclose and report property that is excess to contract performance. So there needs to be some methodology established, some process established to determine when something is excess. I know, I know. In theory, the the time it becomes excess is when the contract is physically complete. And we can even go so far as to say when all warranty provisions have expired for that property. But it, it, in reality, does it mean something more than that for an item to be excess to the contract or for use? Well, there are numerous reasons that we could elaborate on that construct of excess and when that can be disclosed when that can be reported. So, from these three calls, causal references, it appears there's no explicit requirement 
for it to, to track the actual usage. But from my perspective, as a good manager, as a good property manager, I have three thoughts. Number one, without tracking usage, how would you compute rent or proposed use on other contracts? You wouldn't know. Without tracking usage, how would you know when an item is excess? You wouldn't know. And is the tracking of use or an, uh, uh, tracking of use in industry leading practice or a customary practice as evidenced by Mr. Bob McFarlane and his writings there? Now, notice I didn't say it was a VCS, but I can challenge you that if we were to look at things like ISO 55000, if we were to look at the guiding principles of property management under the ASTM E53 committee publications, use, use of government property is a critical aspect and the, the embedded requirement of tracking utilization still exists there, still exists there. So uh, disclose and report excess. I, I have some stuff uh, that, that I, I, I'm presenting more from an experiential statement, a rhetorical question. Lots of times in my class, students have responded to the question, do you track use of government property as statement? Well, we, we issued the asset to the factory floor for contract X. My response, hey, that's really cool. How do you know it is being used on contract X? If you go down to the floor, are there not multiple workers? Might there not be many people running a machine? And if they can use that machine and an item of tooling or test equipment or equipment on some other job, they might say, well, it, it's here, it's available. What, we're not supposed to use it? And the question is, well, if it's government property, you need to make sure you're using it on the contract under which it was furnished or authorized for use. My second question is, if you don't track use of an asset, how will you ever know that it is excess? Now, I'm going off on a tangent here. Notice the left-hand slide of the slide says, says tangent, but there, there's a technical issue here that, in my opinion, is, is a boo-boo. Uh, broached it to the big people in Washington. Hopefully, they'll fix it. But look at paragraph 2, B2, that's highlighted in red, that it says you can use government uh, property on subcontracts of any tier. Well, good, I like that idea. Subcontracts of any tier, so long as it's under this prime contract, it's being used to perform work for this prime contract, but it's I that bothers me, that the contracting officer has to approve that subcontract, specifically authorizing such use. I would challenge you. Go out and take a look at the subcontracts that are out there that have government property on them and see if you've ever gotten any approval from a contracting officer for that subcontract. Uh, in my opinion, this does not happen. And even more so, we do not want this to happen. Otherwise, the government gets into the role of overseer for every single subcontracting action and to be honest, the government doesn't have the people to do that. And, and what would they use to determine whether a subcontract should or should not be, be approved? So tangential, I think this is a technical problem. I'm going to go way out on a limb. I know this is being recorded. But in my opinion, this is wrong. We should not be doing that. We took out that type of review and approval out of the FAR and the rewrite in many different areas. Here, here's one that. Well, uh, this one slipped through the cracks there. So, a uh, rental. How do you determine rental? Well, one of the ways to do it is to use a property appraisal from an independent licensed accredited certified appraisal that computes a monthly, daily, or hourly rental for comparable property. And then you can use that rental rate to determine to compute rent. Oh, wait a minute. Don't you then have to track its actual use to determine how many hours you used it or how many days you used it or how many months you used that property for other work to compute that rental? Sort of a problem here unless you're tracking actual use. Rental charges shall be determined by multiplying the rental time by the, the rental rate. Well, wait a minute. Rental time? Rental time means that you need to keep track of the amount of use. How much time 
has that property been used on contract X, contract Y, contract Z? Lots of different things there that are applicable that give you that implicit requirement. So to compute rent, this requirement requires that you determine the actual use of government property to perform that computation. Without that, how could you actually do any of that? So a real concern, all right? Um, there are other formulas out there that are, are based upon the, the hourly rental rate there. This was the old formula based upon the old rental factor used in the original Dash 9 that was out there. Eh, all right, the 2% is fine. I prefer the appraisal methodology. So though there's no requirement under FAR 52245-1F1VIII to actually track the actual use, it appears that to comply with other contractual requirements, there's an implicit requirement to do so in sufficient detail to support, defend, or determine actual use. Well, is this situation unique about having implicit requirements? No. No, and I, I wanted to show you another one. When we talk about title under the government property clause, we always say, well, the government has title to all property under a cost reimbursement type contract. And, and no, 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 that, that's not the case. The government takes title to property that is reasonable, allocable, and allowable. But it doesn't say that anywhere within the government property clause. The government property clause does use a phrase uh, to which the contractor is entitled to be reimbursed. And therefore, those four words, entitled to be reimbursed, take us over to another clause. It's an implicit requirement that takes us to the allowable cost and payment clause, which takes us to FAR 31.2, which defines for us raw, reasonable, allocable, allowable, and then gives us specific examples for material, for special tooling, for special test equipment. The, this one other part that I have here, it, it's not meant as a threat. It, it's meant as more of a humorous issue right now because some of the things that have been posted to the NPMA webpage. Uh, the use and charges clause also details unauthorized use. Prior to the last rewrite of the uses and charges clause, the contracting officer could hold the contractor accountable and, and demand money. Can't do that anymore. That was a, a summary judgment. No, no uh, judge was involved. It was just the CEO making a decision when in point of fact the law is clear. Here's one that you should memorize, 18 U.S.C. 641. Whoever embezzles, steals, purloins, or knowingly converts to his use to the other without authority, sells, conveys anything of value to the U.S. or any department, and here's the part in red, or any property made or being made under contract for the United States or any department or agency shall be fined under this title and imprisoned not more than 10 years or both. Now, in today's environment, there are newspaper headlines after newspaper headlines uh, that are being per prosecuted under this statutory requirement, 18 U.S.C. 641. You should know it. You should be aware of it. Are we going to send workers on the floor to jail? No, no. The government always addresses those things with managerial personnel. But now that you've seen some of the concerns about use, I would urge some caution about that. So here, here's something, all right? You're not allowed to laugh, all right? You can't laugh, all right? I know that this may sound humorous. I know that this may sound even stupid. But if actual use is not tracked, how will unauthorized use ever be disclosed, all right? Uh, it's sort of self-incriminating. That if I track the use for which I'm authorized to use property for, as well as the actual use, well, authorized use is okay, but any other actual use, it would appear it would be unauthorized. So if you track both approved use, authorized use, and actual use, the delta there is unauthorized use. I've always got a kick out of that. I thought that was funny. I don't know how many contractors really want to self-incriminate themselves. There's some other stuff in the DFARS about statutory non-recurring -re costs. That's something else. If we look at audit protocols, 
from the guidebook out there on, on, on the uh, acquisition website. Our outcome of utilization involves ensuring the contractor uses government property only as authorized. Contractor is required to promptly report government property excess. Right? Contractor inventory defined in 45101 in the government property clause. But here's the kicker. To test for compliance, the PA shall examine the contractor's controls and procedures, perform sufficient testing to ensure the contractor utilizes government property only as authorized by the contract. Will your government PA ask you, has there been any commercial use? Has this been any has has there been any use of government property under other contracts? And oh by the way, did you get permission to use it on those other contracts? Interesting. Interesting to see how they have. So here are some of my questions, uh, uh, stuff that I've learned out in the field while doing my classes or doing audits or doing reviews. This statement is made, but, but, but Doug, I, I issued it out to the lab. That shows I'm using it. Uh, really? I see on your record here that it was issued a year ago. How do I know that you're using it on an authorized contract? Using it on an authorized contract. How do I know how much it is being used? Should I assume 24-7, 365? Well, no, 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 we, we don't do that. We, we only run 40-hour-a-week operations. Okay, so is it being used for 40 hours? Um, well, well, no. Well, how much is it being used uh, on that work? And if you don't know, I have a problem. What about commercial use? Can I distinguish looking at your records what has been used for government authorized use? What has been used for commercial use? Third bullet there. How do I know it's still being used and not excess? What evidence is available to show this? So, so I'm an auditor, and I like going out and doing audits at times. All right, I am always looking for evidence that a process and outcome are complete. And we saw this under 52245-1, paragraph F. One, VIII, uh, the requirement for uh, utilization of government property. So what should we be doing? What might we be thinking about? And I can't force you to do any of this. I'm just trying to, to tell you to think about it, lest at some point you get written up. So for equipment, various types of equipment have counters or meters that specifically require a job number, an order number to be entered before an asset may or can be used. Where do I see this? Uh, CNC, Computer Numerically Controlled Machines, NC machines that are out there where the operator needs to, to type in on a computer keyboard, normally covered with a thick, heavy sheet of plastic, uh, what job he or she is going to run and, and relating that time back to a contract. For computers, well, Having worked with Big Brother for 35 years and having him watch over my shoulder many, many times, there's software management systems out there, software management system programs out there that can track every single keystroke that you do such that they know uh, when you're using uh, uh, that computer to, to actually write up letters or, or even to, to, to graze on Facebook uh, to see how my grandkids are doing, you know? Uh, Wonder, is that, that considered official government use, right? Uh, vehicles, current technologies allows the tracking of usage on a vehicle. Uh, I know that numerous of my cars, current cars, uh, uh, not old cars like some other people use, like Chuck Wozak, and I have to mention him by name because he loves old Volvos. Current technologies with our cars track all of its use, not for what purpose, but for how many miles it's being driven. NPMA had last month uh, its fleet management requirements there. Well, fleet management, DOD has an entire manual on non-tactical vehicle requirements, and those require logs to be maintained. STE, uh, most of the contemporary ST that I've seen is, is run off of uh, a computer, has uh, much of that done via computer controls. Uh, something to think about how that's done. 
uh, how that can be recorded as to that. Otherwise, you might need uh, manual records. Special test equipment, great. So you show me that it was issued from a tool crib to a certain job. But what evidence, what proof do you have that that item of special tooling is actually being used on, uh, on that specific government contract? Lots of different stuff. So I don't want you to take my opinion. Uh, what I did was to, to try and extract or go to a number of websites to see what they address, how they specify utilization of equipment. There's a whole bunch out there. Uh, the one from Mercury Associates is our fleet management stuff. Definitely take a look at that. Uh, in, in terms of uh, forklifts, uh, Crown Industries uh, uh, has uh, computerized systems built into their forklifts that does every tracking because they have to be concerned about battery power consumption, recharging, bump control if a forklift hits a, a wall or a, a pole or things of that nature. Really, really interesting stuff. So, in my humble opinion, M-I-H-O, hey, I, I know what that means from texting. Over the past few years, utilization records have been given, in my opinion, short shrift. Receiving only a cursory review as to the contract that the property was accountable to, and very little attention as to the actual usage. The issue of excess has to be addressed, and without utilization records, Proper utilization records, government property that is excess may not be properly disclosed. Engineers on both sides, on the government side and contractor side, well, they will always be with us. And they want to keep everything because one day they, they may need it. Um, I've seen that and I've heard that statement over and over and over again. And in my opinion, it doesn't wash, right? Some takeaways. So contractors, I'd encourage you, review your property management system procedures to ensure discussion of use or utilization of SD, SD and equipment. Determine the records that are involved. What, what do you need as a minimum? The project on which used, when used, the amount of time used for each project. Why? Why do you want to do that? To support retention requirements, to support non-excess statements or determination, to support calculations of rent due when applicable. Government property folks on the government side, I ask that you think deeply about your role in testing use under your property management system analysis. Are you doing it right? And though I talked about only FAR references, um, there are a lot of other agencies out there. Uh, NASA has the FAR supplement. Uh, FAA has their own acquisition management regs. Department of Energy has its supplement. Uh, Doe has the deers. Okay, that, that was a bad joke. I thought it was something you could fawn over. So my idea there is you not, need to know not only to look at the FAR, but any supplemental requirements that are out there. So uh, I, I just have this one to throw out as a tease to you. And no, no, I don't have an answer. Uh, does your company provide you a cell phone? Is that cell phone charged to a government contract? Who has title to that cell phone? Do you track its utilization? Now here's the kicker. Has there ever been any unauthorized use? And how do you know? So last thing there, because I've talked about STSD and equipment and, and didn't mention other stuff, well, there's a reason for that. Because when we talk about material, we have to test that under consumption using bill of materials, material requirements list, master production schedule, all that stuff. And, and in my opinion, though a consumption analysis is extremely difficult to do right, it's easier to track than utilization. And even with consumption, we need to look at things like excess and how it interacts with things like the material management accounting system under the DOD. With that said, I've rambled for too long. Uh, there, there I am. Uh, there's my phone number. Uh, there's my website. Uh, I will be posting this to that website. I'm sure that Jessica will be posting it to the NPMA website. Uh, look at it, study it, analyze it. If you got questions, uh, feel free. And at, at this point, then Jessica, if, if there are any questions out there.